Welcome everyone to our third installment of class. It's great to see everyone. I have uh, four, five copies of one of the two textbooks with me tonight that I would be willing to loan out for the next three or four weeks if people want them. And if people really want other copies, I've got about five or six more. So I found them in the shop, which is all very exciting. Um, for the camera, I'm Dr. Sarah Oktai, and we're gonna be talking about both wave circulation and atmospheric circulation today. Um, one thing that is sad is that um, our wonderful globe that had all of the ocean's currents on them, my husband thought it was supposed to go to the dump. So oh, no. I was gonna bring it back today. It's a very groovy glo globe, so if anyone's at the take it or leave it, I, I'll put a bounty out of 20 bucks on that guy, so. <laughs> Uh, if you see it, it's old and kind of raggedy, but it lights up, and it's a globe with all the currents. So I found out literally five minutes before, I'm like, honey, where's the globe? And he's like, oh, you wanted that? And that's what happens when you're packing. If we had a small child, that would probably already be at the dump, too, in, in, a, in a box crying, which is why we don't have small children, probably. So, um, but you know, we have kept most of our stuff, so you, you know how frantic packing goes. So today we're going, and this will be on Dropbox as soon as I get back today, and like I said, I have the textbooks here. Uh, the first two ones are also on Dropbox. We've sent the link around. If you have not gotten the links from Amy or I, um, they should be coming from the Nantucket Athenaeum um, from Amy, but let us know if you're not getting those. And then this is, of course, is being broadcast by NCTV, thanks to Larry LeCain, who's back here, hopefully putting me in a good light. Thank you, Larry, who's donating his time, by the way, to film this. And um, thanks to the Nantucket Athenaeum for offering this type of class. I'm uh, very excited to be here talking about oceanography and uh, kind of uh, getting uh, one last chance to talk with all my favorite Nantucket people. So can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I can talk as loud as I want. We want to make sure to keep feedback. So I'll be lowering my voice and raising it. But, and if you have a question, just put your hand up while we're going. I'm going to go pretty quick today, but I think you guys can all handle it. So today we're going to talk about atmospheric circulation, um, something near and dear to all sailors' hearts, and ocean circulation. Next two weeks from today, February 2nd, we're going to discuss all kinds of beautiful creatures. So it'll be all about marine biology. And then the last class on the ninth will be about, um, we'll probably throw a little bit in about salt marshes, but it's gonna be the use and abuse of the ocean. So we'll talk about fisheries, um, energy extraction, oil drilling, um, using tides for energy, all kinds of things like that. So that will be, and then fisheries and how, you know, how we make our living on the ocean, a little bit about transportation and all that kind of fun stuff. So anyway, without further ado, I'm using these two. This text is the Garrison text and then also Mark Denny's. And um, I can bring copies of that. So if people do want to check these out, just let me know and you maybe could go home with one. So we're all breathing hopefully here in the atmosphere. And we are breathing, here's the 20% or so of 20.9% of oxygen that we're actually using and the nitrogen. And then all the rest of the gases, argon, carbon dioxide, helium, methane, neon, are all this little slice. So the atmosphere is composed mainly of those items and water vapor. So the lower atmosphere is pretty homogeneous, pretty well mixed. Water vapor occupies up to 4% of the volume of the atmosphere. And the density of the air is influenced by two things. It's humidity, the amount of moisture in it, and it's temperature. So these are the ways that air, po air parcels move. This is one at 30 degrees, 20 degrees, and 10 degrees. As it expands and cools, as it compresses, it gets warmer. And we'll talk through. We're gonna actually, you're gonna cover more physics tonight than you probably had in all of college. But I promise to make it um, relatively pain-free. And um, when you leave, you'll at least know enough to win some trivia games or something. So here is the heating, solar heating of the Earth varies with latitude. We know this, and when we're standing at the equator, we're warmer than when we're standing right where we are now. So the rays strike at different angles. Uh, it's parallel to the surface, so very little sunlight reaching the poles. The full effect of the sunlight in the shortest distance right there at the Earth. 
the solar heating of Earth varies with latitude. Here's another way to look at it. Here's that surplus heat we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. Here's the deficit. And here is zero latitude. This is the equator. A little bit above 30 degrees north and south, 60 degrees, and you can see the difference in heat insulation. So most of what we're talking today is how does this heat get moved around the planet? Why are we not boiling at the equator and freezing at the poles? Not that the poles are warm, but um, they're much warmer than they would be if it wasn't for all these circulation systems. Here's another way of showing this. We would be much, much hotter at the equator, much colder, if we didn't transport this heat using a variety of means. And of course, the heat varies with the angle of the sun and with the seasons. So during the winter season, we are facing away from the sun and getting less, less solar radiation. So what's getting set up is a series of convection currents. And a simple, just as a review of a convection current, you've got hot air coming off this radiator if it's working in your home, coming up and hitting the ceiling, warming up your ceiling and not helping you, going across here, hitting a cold window where you hope all of it doesn't get sucked out. And if you're smart and the window's closed and insulated, it's going to cool off, sink, and come back. So this is a natural convection that you could measure in your room if you were paying attention. If you had a really accurate um, wind speed velocity meter, you could see this, connect, this convection. And obviously, if you have smoke or anything like that, you're going to see that happening, in case any of you guys are doing a science fair project this week. So Earth's solar, uneven solar radiation results in large-scale atmospheric circulation. So we've got heat rising at the equator, and then it's going to come up to the poles and sink. This is in a hypothetical model. Um, not assuming anything with Coriolis forces or um, with centripetal and centrifugal force. This is just what you would see if this was the only thing happening on the planet. So of course we are spinning. Um, we're, we're rotating around on the Earth. And the first set of three things that's going to scare you is the, fir the first, second, and third law of motion. Newton's laws of motion. Uh, Newton, of course, discovering and putting into equations the forms of gravity and how the Earth and the size of the Earth is related to our weight. So the first law is, unless, oops, pardon me, unless an object feels an unbalanced force, its state of motion will not change. So this is the law of inertia. Everything's moving in a straight line. If it changes or speeds up, some force is acting upon that. So this can be either speed or direction, but without that, if you're floating around in space, you're gonna quickly find out that you're going to keep going straight without friction or any change. You're, going to, you're not going to change your, your um, acceleration or direction. The second law, don't worry, there won't be a test. If you were taking the class, there would be a test. Um, second law, the acceleration of an object, the rate of change of its state of motion is proportional to the net force applied and inversely proportional to the object's mass. So all this, this is a long way of saying that force is equal to the acceleration times the mass. So it's inversely proportional to mass, and it's directly proportional to the, fo the force is inverse to the uh, mass and directly proportional to acceleration. Bigger objects with bigger mass <laughs> exert more force. That's what we're saying there. The third law, if an object exerts a force on another object, it's got an equal and opposite force the other direction. And we'll see, when we're standing on the planet, we are exerting a force down, and the ground is exerting a force up which seems strange, but we'll, we'll talk about how centripetal and centrifugal force works. Once we talk about actual examples of these, all of these, you'll understand are actually intrinsic to what you believe and know. So let's take a bucket. I should have brought a bucket and put water in it and scared the heck out of Amy. Um, but if you swing water in a bucket, if you swing it fast enough, the water is going to stay in the bucket, right? If you swing it slow, the water is going to come out. So you are, you're exerting a force. The force is what you're feeling on that rope, on that tug. And it's traveling, if you're really good at swinging buckets, at a relatively constant speed. Um, and it has mass, obviously, and that mass, part of that force is going into the bucket, uh, and centrifugal force is pulling it away from you. So the force of uh, acting on the pail is the tug of the rope. You've got a stationary, let's say once again, you're a really good bucket spinner. Your, your hand is relatively stationary, and you're spinning this bucket. 
The center-seeking force is centripetal force. Everyone's heard of centrifugal force. When you're riding in a merry-go-round or something or you're spinning your kid around, everyone's aware of the force pulling out when you're turning in a circle. But there's a counter force pulling in, and that's centripetal force, center-seeking. That's pulling the pail and water toward the center. The equal and opposite force, centrifugal, which we enjoy if we're at a, at a um, amusement park, is pulling the opposite way and keeping the water in the bucket. This is a within the system force. Um, from a distance, as an observer, you wouldn't necessarily see the water staying in the bucket. For the ocean, the centripetal force is gravity. So that's what's holding the ocean to the planet. That is that center seeking force. So we're spinning around on the globe. If we look down, we're going counterclockwise, spinning that way. Um, this is from Denny, so this is the figure number. So gravity varies with latitude and altitude and to a little lesser extent um, topography. So because of the centrifugal force, if you're standing at the equator, you're actually going to weigh less because the Earth's trying to fling you off more than gravity's holding you down. So try that sometime. Don't eat anything. Weigh yourself here. Fly quickly to the equator. Weigh yourself in a really good squat. Don't eat anything. Don't sweat or anything. And you will weigh a little bit less. So this has to do with the, the mass and the gravity at the center. And even though we're bulging at the center, you're going to have more centrifugal force in that spinning at the center. It's going a little bit faster. It's a little bit wider. That force is bigger. I'm going to just leave these links in here for you guys to find on Dropbox, but it's really cool. It shows that, remember we were talking last week about the layered earth, and we've got that inner core? That inner core is solid with a lot of iron. It's spinning one way. The molten, the outer inner core is actually revolving the other way. Scientists just found this out five or six years ago. This whole article talks about it, and it's super cool. And then once again, everything we're talking about today is talking about one set of movement and another set of counter movements. So when you go look at the clock at the Whaling Museum and you see all of these gears, one gear is going this way, the other gears, that's how the atmosphere is circulating, that's how the inside of the Earth is circulating, and that's how the ocean is circulating. One thing moving one way, another thing moving the other way. This is a really cool article that talks about it. And then if you're really into physics, um, this is actually a very, very good, simple article that goes through and talks about latitude man and talks about his force on gravity at different latitudes and explains what I just explained to you in more detail. So this next slide, I know this is really not great, but this is me taking a picture with my thumb of um, another book, which is the Mark Denny book. And it had some really good ways of showing. So here's the North Pole, the South Pole, the equator. We're ignoring the tilt of the Earth for this. This is gravity pulling down. Here is centrifugal force trying to throw you off. And here's centripetal force supplied by gravity bringing you into the Earth. So you're actually pulled in at that latitude. You're not actually pulled down. Everyone thinks you're being pulled to the center of the Earth. But you're, the, the force is actually being applied straight in at latitude. A little esoteric, but this will come into play in a second because we're going to start spinning the globe, right? And we're going to start throwing water on it and atmosphere on it and people and, you know, thankfully we don't have whales flying out of the ocean and into space. And all of this is because of the Coriolis effect and gravity. So the Coriolis effect is the deflection of a moving object caused by the moving frame of reference on the spinning Earth. Um, as air warms, expands, and rises at the equator, it starts heading up to the poles. But because we're spinning, it's going to turn to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So it moves in a circle. And you can observe this. Um, each time, this is one thing I hope everyone, by the time I tell you this 20 different ways in the next 20 slides, northern hemisphere, Coriolis effect, we're spinning to the right, we're going to go to the right. So, Southern hemisphere, you're going to bend to the left. So here is the Earth is a little skinnier. Here's at Buffalo, the area with all the snow. Here's Quito. Earth is fatter. Here is the path of Quito around the planet. So Quito is moving at this speed. It's going a longer distance in space. 
still at 15 degrees. Buffalo moves at 12,650 kilometers per hour. So it's going a shorter distance in space, but it's attached to the globe. So when you think of the globe spinning, it's shaped like this, and each part of it is actually spinning at a different speed, but we're all keeping together. So this is talking about cannonballs, if we're launching cannonballs. If you're spinning here in this part of the globe, it's going to go to the right. If you're spinning down in here, it's going to go to the left. And it talks about the deflection of each of these things as the Earth is spinning. Well, once we've started talking about winds, this will all, almost everyone here has been in a boat or knows about sailing. So every time you're in a boat using the winds, you're, you're using all of these theories. So this London lawyer and philosopher theorized that as Earth, I don't know why he was thinking about winds and stuff, but maybe too many you know, legal issues or something, but he was thinking about hot air. And he said, as long as air was heated at the equator, it would rise, and as it cooled at the poles, it would sink. Hot air rises, cold air sinks. He proposed that convection cell I showed you two slides ago. He figured that this would create a giant circle of air moving from the poles to the equator and from the equator to the poles. He also theorized that the heating of the ocean at the equator would cause the water to evaporate and fill the air above it, making it humid. Now this next part is really interesting. Humid air is even less dense than dry air. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? But guess what weighs less than nitrogen and pure oxygen is water. So water is H2O, but it weighs less than nitrogen gas or oxygen gas, which is dual, you know, so it's not 16, that's 32 Daltons. So water's 18 Daltons versus 28 to 32. Isn't that cool? Isn't that totally opposite? When you're in a warm sauna room, doesn't the air feel heavier? It's actually lighter. Fully saturated air at room temperature is 1% lighter than dry air. So that's going to come in handy. I mean, how do monsoons get started? How do these moisture-laden storms rise up and get into the atmosphere? So this Hadley cell only goes halfway. Wind moving air from the equator to the poles carries about half the heat flux to equalize these air temperatures. Once it gets to a certain point, this hot air at the tropics rises and creates an area of low pressure at the equator at five degrees north and south. So the air is rising and creating low pressure this is called an equatorial low, which varies a little bit with the seasons. The region between 25 to 35 degrees north and south sits under a column of cooled high density air and has a consistent high pressure called a subtropical high. So air moves down from this high pressure to the low pressure areas creating a loop that ends around 30 degrees north and south instead of 60 north and south like Hadley thought. There's two other balancing cells the feral cell and the polar cell that complete the picture and all of them are rotating around just like a giant merry-go-round subject to Coriolis forces. Here's another way to word these six cells and I'll show you a picture of them. So here's the earth, here are these winds picking up and moving in this direction. So you've got the air rising and then sinking rising and then sinking, bending to the right in the northern hemisphere to the left. If you're the wind, you're bending to the left in the southern hemisphere. And here are the westerlies, which are feral cells, coming to meet them. So every time you bring down air, you're basically forcing air down. It's going to move away. So you've got air coming up and coming down. It's heated here, right? So it's rising, it cools, and it comes back and it creates the winds that we use every day. The southeasterly trade winds, the northeasterly trades, the westerlies, and then the polar cells. All of this balances out and takes, here's two different ways to view it. Here's a profile, air going up, coming down, air going up and coming down. You've got this low pressure where the doldrums are. Sailors knew all about this. They just didn't realize they were putting all these pieces together. You've got some subtropical highs here, sunnier weather, more high pressure. And then your mid-latitude cells. This is all balancing that heat for the entire planet. I just mentioned a few of these, but the big ones to remember are the doldrums, especially for sailors, calm equatorial areas where two of those Hadley cells converge at the intertropical convergence zone. 
Horse latitudes are calm areas between Hadley and Farrell cells. Trade winds are surface winds of Hadley cells. Westerlies are surface winds of Farrell cells. So next time you're sailing, you can impress the heck out of your fellow sailors. And I'm sure most sailors actually know all of this. So here is a big picture. Have you ever gone onto the internet and seen all of the currents and winds moving in real time? It's beautiful. And this is showing all of these things occurring, different eddies setting up. All of this is, is temperature being transported on a moving globe, on a big marble. These are winds over the Pacific Ocean in 1996. Wind speed increases as colors change from blue purple to yellow orange, with the strongest winds at 45 miles per hour at 20 meters per second. And then this, each of these little arrows shows you the velocity and direction. Okay, if Newton's laws of gravity weren't enough to totally freak you out, we're going to talk about a couple of gas laws. Simple ones. Higher the temperature, the more the gas molecules move around. That makes sense, right? If you're in a room and you heat up the room, the molecules are actually bouncing off you faster. So the gas starts taking up more space. That's how we float up in a hot air balloon, which if you've never done, I highly recommend. Um, as it expands, the density goes down. As air cools, it takes up less space and its volume goes down. As air is compressed, it warms up. Think about a bike pump. When you're compressing air, you're gonna warm it up. As air is expanded, it cools. When you're releasing air from an air tank or a can of paint, you are releasing compressed air and it's expanding and it always chills, right? Density is mass per given volume. A fixed number of gas molecules has a fixed mass, but it can assume all kinds of different volumes. Heating the gas lowers its density, floats it, cooling it increases the density and causes it to sink. So air in the tropics, you add humidity, so it's less dense and it's hot, so it really wants to rise, and it sets off these four events. It rises, as soon as it rises, the pressure goes down. As the pressure goes down, the air expands. As it expands, it cools. And as it cools, it can't hold the water that it had in it before, so it drops the water out as rain. So cold air, like if you get condensation on a can in a hot climate, that is because you're giving off that, that humidity that it can't hold. As the water vapor condenses and rains out, it gives off latent heat. And as it cools, it, it starts sinking. Here's an example of each of these cells. So here's your westerlies, here's your high pressure your mid-latitude cell, your polar cell. Here's the northeasterly trades, southeasterly trades converging. Right here, here's the intertropical convergence zone. Where these trade winds blow, we actually start affecting the ocean. Here's the winds coming to the left, going to the left here for the westerlies, doing its polar thing up here, going to the right, going to the right, and going to the right. It's another example, same thing. Trade winds, trade winds coming together at the equator, going away at 30 south and north. One of the things that's happening with climate change is we're speeding this up. And this is one of the things scientists didn't really think about, is there's a lot of really big things that we are, you know, we're having more frequent hurricanes. Um, they're starting to theorize that they might even be stronger hurricanes because there's more fuel in the ocean in the form of hot water. Hot water is what fuels these storms. So the more heat, the more fuel. And in this case, we are changing the shape of the Hadley cells, and so they're getting fatter at the equator. And we're getting more moisture being moved faster. So all of our deserts are getting more deserty, and all the areas where rainfall would occur are getting more rainfall. And that makes sense, right? The Earth is trying to balance this excess heat. So it's trying to deposit it somewhere where it can be dealt with. So these cells are growing and they're accelerating in speed. And so that's why a lot of people don't understand why you have changes in climate across the whole globe because of the increased warmth. And it's because of these Hadley cells. So here's the desert areas, which are at 30 degrees north and south, and that's where the downdrift of the warm, drier air creates the world's deserts. Right along in here and in here. You can see them right along here too, the great deserts. 
That intertropical convergence zone, we'll have a, show you a picture of that in a second, these surface winds collide near the equator. They're driven upward in the area known as the doldrums. They lower right at the ITZZ. Because of the seasons and the tilt of the earth, it's gonna be about five or 10 degrees. This air is buoyant and contains moisture and affects rainfall on the equator. Here's an example. See how cool it is? You can actually see the clouds. This is the, the um, intertropical convergence zone. Right above zero degrees is right about there. That's the equator. And this is all of the clouds set up by that. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is there an altitude limit to the size of these cells, or is that a constant? That's a really good question. There would be an altitude limit. Uh, they, and I bet you they probably have figured out how big they can grow. So at that point, how you might transport more heat to the poles, there probably is going to be some tipping points. Um, yeah, because once you get to a certain point, basically the change in density and stratosphere limits our atmosphere. So I don't think the whole atmosphere of the planet is going to get that much bigger. That's a really good question. I'll check it out. And um, that's, that's really thinking. Um, so there should be a limit to that. And at that point, would we set up more violent events? You know, is there a tipping point? Um, I don't know what would happen. That's a good one. Um, we might have more storms. Storms are a reset mechanism. They're variations in large scale atmospheric circulation. So storms are regional atmospheric disturbances that we get to feel for real here all the time that are rotating masses of low pressure air either within or between large masses of air. So usually you get high pressure, low pressure fighting, and you end up with a storm. Your tropical cyclones originate in the tropical regions and they cause millions of dollars. Extra tropical cyclones occur at mid latitudes. So those are the, the terms between polar cells and feral cells. So when we think of having a, a hurricane or a nor'easter, it's extra tropical. Is the, here is the amount of um, fuel in the equator that is redistributed through tropical storms. It's a pretty large swath. So this material, this heat, has to be transported either through winds, currents, storms, or thermal halion circulation, which we'll talk about next. Here's why those um, cyclones and tornadoes and hurricanes, not tornadoes so much, but hurricanes, tornadoes on a smaller uh, pathway, go where they go. They're all originating in this belt of heat right along in here. And they're bending to the right in the <coughs> northern hemisphere and bending to the left in the southern hemisphere. So ocean circulation, so we switch from atmospheric circulation to ocean circulation. The mass flow of water is a phenomenon we call currents. We have surface currents and we have deep currents. We're going to talk about each of them. Surface currents are typically wind-driven, movements of water at or near the surface. Thermohaline currents are slow, deep currents that affect the vast bulk of seawater below the picnocline. And the picnocline is the change in density. It's when you go from having warmer water to colder water and it's saltier, and so you'll have this sharp line that's called the picnocline. Thermal halene circulation, circulation based on temperature and based on salinity, is caused by differences in density from changes in temperature and salinity. This is the, one of the many things that we're most concerned about in global warming. We're causing the melting of glaciers. It's dumping a lot of cold, cold, fresh water into the northern parts of the ocean, and that's changing thermal halene circulation. And that circulation is the heat pump for the whole world, which is why we're concerned about the whole planet. So here's our westerlies and our trade winds. Once again, about 10% of the water in the world's ocean is involved in surface currents, water flowing horizontally in the uppermost 400 meters. That's what you would call a surface current. Forces driving surface currents and creating gyres include winds, sun's heat, Coriolis effect, and gravity. All of these are what creates gyres, those little things that spin off. When you think, and we'll talk about the Gulf Stream, we get turtles and all kinds of cool tropical fish entrained in gyres, and they bring it all the way up here to Nantucket. Those are being spun off the Gulf Stream, and they are rotating in opposite direction to the Gulf Stream itself. They're a great way to think about currents. 
if only I had my little globe. Anyway, <laughs> here is an idealized. So we always talk about the model, and then we talk about reality. So being forced to the right and then down and around, this is the combination of forces. If you took the full class, we'd have a whole day just on Coriolis forces and you'd probably hate me. But I've combined all of that information and you know, there'll be a few trusting moments here. But this is the way the gyre goes in the Northern Atlantic and in the Southern Atlantic. Because of Coriolis forces, the spin of the Earth, temperature, the winds, and surface currents. Because of pressure, high pressure that builds up in the center of the North Atlantic and the strength of the Gulf Stream, which is a boundary current, it actually becomes this oblong thing. So you've got trade winds and the northern equatorial current coming up, feeding up into here. Here's your Gulf Stream coming into the North Atlantic current and then coming down through the Canary Current. This is your North Atlantic gyre. Gyre just means a big circle. It's not a euro. That would be a lamb sandwich, a gyre. So when you talk about the Pacific gyre, remember all that plastic that's getting entrained or the Sargasso Sea? Those are both surrounded by currents that are corralling it into a circle. That's why you get all this junk um, bound up in a giant gyre. The Sargasso Sea is a really cool example of that. So which is, it's about right about here. And it's created by the spin of the Gulf Stream. So the, the we'll go into detail, but these, um, western boundary currents are deep and fast, and the eastern boundary currents are shallow and slow because of the speed, the deflection, Coriolis forces, temperature, and our spinning earth. Now, this is probably one of the most basic parts of oceanography, but sometimes hard to understand. This is called the Ekman spiral. And you can actually observe it if you're out, even walking in the harbor, if you pay attention to how the current moves down from the surface to the bottom, this is what's happening as it gets deflected. The wind is blowing this way. Your direction of force is at an angle to the wind because of Coriolis. So this is friction and it's gonna start rotating. It's gonna keep bending to the right, right? Because we're still on the planet. And so you're gonna create this spiral that's going to go at about 45 degrees opposite of the wind as you go down through the water column. As you go down, you have lots of friction, so that force is getting less and less and less. So you could do an experiment with a rope that was lightly weighted, and you would see that there's more, more force on it closer to the surface, and as you go down, there's less force because of friction and gravity. But it's still trying to turn you that way. If you were a particle that wanted to move the way that the currents went, you would always be drifting toward the right in the northern hemisphere. It's a kind of weird thing, but you can see it. The easy, it's easier to see the deeper you're going to. You can see that force, but it's going to get dampened by friction. I think usually I've been about 200 meters in the ocean. So here is the trade winds pushing along, blowing along 15 degrees north. The angle of the water is going to bend to the right. If it was going to, if there's no friction, it would go directly 90 degrees, but there is friction, so it's going to be closer to 45 degrees. So water at the surface can flow at a velocity no greater than about 3% of the speed of the driving wind. Um, so you actually are creating a vortex. At the very bottom, water is flowing in a direction opposite of the surface current. You guys kind of notice that setting up in, even in, um, well, there's lots of reasons for that in the channel. The reason you've got an outside current going the opposite way is because the inside current's pushing in so much. But um, this does happen everywhere in the ocean. Here's what's happening in the middle of the Atlantic. You're actually building a hill up here. If you're really good at measuring elevation changes, if you're in the middle of the Atlantic or in the middle of the Pacific, you would be on a little hill. On the, this side of North America, it's going to be lower, and this is that high pressure. And this is the balance of the Coriolis effect bending you around, and you've got a pressure gradient moving back and forth, and you'd have a little depression here. Balance between the Coriolis effect and pressure gradient is pulling in opposite direction. There's actually a two meter hill of water in the west central part of the North Atlantic. So this is six feet higher here than on the edges. Here's the big gyres of the world. Here's this North Atlantic, here's the Pacific Gyre. 
Here's the, the lower Pacific, southern Atlantic, the other edge of the Pacific gyre, and then that big southern ocean current flowing along from the polar regions. Here is it, if you had my beautiful globe, only $20. Well, if you wait two weeks, I might go up to 50. <laughs> but this is what that globe showed, uh, which means that, you know, and this is one of the first things going all the way back to our history lessons. Sailors going back 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 years were able to start mapping these currents. So this is probably the first thing we knew about the ocean, was that if you were in a little boat with six you know, companions rowing around in the Pacific, and you hit one of these currents, you'd start either having to row harder or go much faster. And of course, you know, um, Ben Franklin noticed that when we looked at um, major shipping boats getting over here in a week and taking two weeks to get back. It's because they were fighting that Gulf Stream. So here in a second, we're going to talk about this Greenland current and the Labrador current that are bringing in cold air, cold water. The temperatures are relative to the temperature of the water. So these are warm water currents, cold currents. See on the eastern sides of the basin, they're all cold. And on the western side, they're all warm. And that's true pretty much across the board in each of these areas. Here's the Atlantic Circumpolar, which means going around the pole. Here's the Brazil Current. If you're taking oceanography as a college student, you get to measure, memorize all these. You've got your North Equatorial. You've got, every time you've got a strong current going one way, you'll usually get a counter current. That's what I was talking a little bit about when I was talking about the channel. Even in the harbor, you're going to end up with little counter currents. If you've got a strong current going here, you're going to have a shear current going the opposite way. Here's the one, uh, you guys might have seen my Hemingway talk about 10 years ago, talking about the Florida Loop Current and the Gulf of Mexico Current that feeds into the Gulf Stream. So those boundary currents are narrow, fast, and occasionally form eddies. They typically move warm water poleward in each of the gyres. And those are the Gulf Stream, the, the Kuryosho Current that we learned about after Fukushima, the Japanese Current, the Brazil Current, Agulhas in the Indian Ocean, and the Eastern Australia Current. The eastern boundary currents are cold, shallow, broad currents with poorly defined boundaries. They inc include the Canary, the Benguela, the Californian, West Australian and the Peru Current. All of them are right off of areas that sound like good fishing grounds, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. So the general surface circulation in the North Atlantic, the numbers indicate flow rates in a word I can't possibly say, it's Sverendrup's. I actually have a Henry Sverendrup's, um, one of his first books. Um, so he came up with this, this term, this unit, um, if you're really killing it in science, they name a unit after you. So a sparendrip is a million cubic meters of water per second. Think of seabirds or, you know, all kinds of things. Um, that's a lot of water. So it's named after Harold Sverdrup, pioneering oceanographer. The Gulf Stream, see how thick this is? The size of the lines corresponds to the speed. So he discovered the Gulf Stream was 55 sparendrips, 300 times the Amazon's flow. So this is truly a river in the ocean. And if you go to the Gulf Stream, you can see it. You can see it from a couple of miles away. There's a big difference in temperature. And if you're on a boat and you cross it, you can actually feel it, pick up the boat, and move it to the north. Uh, it's very cool. It's, it's actually way more exciting than crossing the equator to see the Gulf Stream. Uh, and it's a different color because of a different temperature. It's got more entrainment of particles, um, a different amount of algae. So it brings all this warmth over to Europe. One of the things that we're concerned about with climate change is that because we're changing the heat balance, it might be affecting the Gulf Stream. And we never thought we could actually change a current. But recently, when oceanographers went out here to test all these currents, some of the currents weren't where they were supposed to be. And some of the currents weren't as fast as they used to be. And they went, uh, what's happening? And it looks like they had actually migrated some. But the reason this is a concern is this is what keeps England warm and Europe warm. Without the Gulf Stream, this all would be much colder. It's bringing warm air from the equator and training it through here and delivering it to Europe and to Spain and to England. 
that's a huge difference. If this gets shut off or changed or deflected north or, or south, it's gonna completely change all the climate there. So that make a little bit more sense when you're traveling around. You can kind of see why these currents, in the, you know, all the way across the Atlantic might be affecting the climate. So it's a big shocker, water flows downhill. Not always, it depends on what planet. But uh, gravity counteracts the Coriolis effect. Pressure is exerted on water. We're talking about all this so we can talk about El Nino. So there's reasons to know all of this. But pressure is defined as the force divided by the area. I'll skip around here. Um, fluids move from high pressure to low pressure, so it moves from the bulge at the equator to the poles. Centrifugal acceleration moves the water to the equator and gravity and pressure push it away. So there's always this fight between centrifugal uh, acceleration and gravity. And in fact, if you look at the Earth, you can see it's bulging a little at the center, and it's not because it's in middle age like me, but it's because it's spinning faster. So it's actually pushing out from that centrifugal force. You would think with gravity that it would be more gravity there at the equator, but the centrifugal force is actually winning, hence you weigh less. Here's that picture of that boundary current. Here's the Gulf Stream being pushed in this direction. It's deep and fast. Here's that hill in the Sargasso Sea. Here's the Canary Current, shallow and slow. Wind causes vertical movement of ocean. So the water's not just circulating around on the surface. It's actually getting driven down, partially because of that Ekman spiral and partially because of thermal haline circulation. So wind induced in vertical circulation is vertical movement induced by wind driven horizontal movement of water. And this is what controls upwelling near the edges of the continents. So upwelling is when we bring nutrient rich water from low areas up to higher areas. So phytoplankton are living in the upper 200 feet of the, of the ocean, eating away, using all of our nutrients and pooping and doing everything phytoplankton do they're gonna actually draw down the nutrients. But below that is nutrient-rich water that no creatures are using, right? And it's basically like oil trapped underneath the ground. So how does that nutrient-rich water get up? And it's driven up by changes in wind and by currents. This upwelling is the upward motion of water. This motion brings cold, nutrient-rich water towards the surface. You can really see this in Sconset if you guys go out to Codfish Park. You know, there's that angle right there. It's such a steep angle. You'll always see all of that algae rolling around in that. You'll see a lot of sand lance, hake, herring. You'll see tons of algae there. It's because you're getting pushed up welling and then you've got currents coming in and bringing water up and that's why all the seals hang out there and all the fish hang out there because they're getting more nutrients. Downwelling is downward motion of water. It doesn't happen as frequently, but it supplies the deeper ocean with nutrients and dissolved gases. And next week when we talk all about the creatures that live in these different levels, you'll see that each of them have adapted to the amount of nutrients and dissolved oxygen. So surface currents affect weather and climate too. Main effects of ocean surface currents transfer heat from tropics to the poles, which affects climates at mid-latitudes. Influence weather and climate. San Francisco has cool, foggy summers because of its location on that side of the basin. Washington, D.C. has hot, humid summers because the equator is bringing hot, humid air to it. Where in California, it's pulling it away. It, all of this distributes nutrients and scatters organisms around the whole ocean. So here's an example of surface flow hitting an area Here's the thermocline, that is the difference, that's the layer in the ocean where temperature is changing. Here's sinking in the polar regions, cold water sinking, and then spreading out through the deep. So this is a way of explaining the movement of water in depth, in depth, haha, <laughs> in depth and in depth. So nutrient-rich water rises near the equator because these winds are pushing it away. So if you sat there, you could do this in your tub, probably, if you were clever. You could put bubbles on top of your tub. If you started pushing the bubbles away like this, you're going to start bringing a current up towards you just by doing that. Same thing when you're swimming, right? You're getting buoyed up when you're doing the breaststroke. You are creating a current that's lifting you up and forward. 
same idea. You use physics every day. So here's the equatorial undercurrent, and here's the current that's bringing up this nutrient-rich water at the equator. What we're more familiar with is here's the Oregon and California coast. If you guys have ever gone surfing there, you notice it's pretty cold. You've got a wind from the north. Remember that big gyre is coming along there? You've also got wind matching that. You've got these mountains right here. It is pushing the water offshore because its wind is coming this way. Remember, we're going 90 degrees, so Ekman transport is out. Here's your thermocline, which is changing with depth. So it's going to push water away, and since water goes away, it's got to come up to replace itself. So all this cold, nutrient-rich water that freezes your buns off when you're trying to surf comes up right along in here. So that is all got tons of nutrients. If you read Cannery Row, you know that this was one of the most prolific fisheries ever. This is why there's so many you know, otters and seals. This is extremely productive because of this physical um, situation. Wind can also induce coastal downwelling at another time of the year. If you've got wind from the south, which isn't quite as common, you push it up that way, Ekman transport is going to push it to the right, right? And you're going to actually force downwelling, and you're going to force that nutrients away. So you can see why you can turn on the pump, and you can bring nutrients to the top, and it's going to start feeding everything, and you can turn off the pump. And that's exactly what happens in the ocean. In this case, the pump would be nutrient-rich food that other phytoplankton haven't stolen. So basin-wide tilt wind, in this case we're talking about trade winds, blow long term over the ocean, causing the water to pile up. And a lot of people don't think about this, but the, the oceans are no different than a bathtub. And if the winds, and we, we see this all the time in our harbor, if the wind's blowing all the time, in this case the scallops are acting as the way of showing us how they're getting pushed from, in this case, the north and northeast to our southern coasts. In the case of the ocean, if the wind's blowing all the time, it's going to push water over to the west side of the basin. All that equatorial wind is blowing everything and pushing it over to that side. It actually piles up when it hits a continent, and it will be thinner on the side where the wind starts, and you can measure that. As it piles up, it pushes the thermocline deeper, and that's that warm area at the top, and it'll go all the way down to 200 meters on the western side of the Pacific. The seasonal shift in the Indian Ocean keeps that from setting up. This basin-wide tilt of the thermocline in the Pacific, sea level is higher and the thermocline is deeper in the warm pool on the western side. And I have a, this is exactly what it looks like. So this is how El Nino gets kind of started. Here's South America, here's, this is called Walker circulation, we won't get into detail, but just here's the trade winds coming up here, they're hitting Indonesia, they're getting, picking up moisture, they're rising and they're coming back. Here's that warm water surface water piling up, and here's the tilt. This is actually higher than this side. If you were really good at measuring, you can measure that. And cold water is gonna press upwards and bring nutrients to these fisheries off of South America, off of Peru and Ecuador and Chile. Too much words on this, but Remember those trade winds and the ITZ? That's what's pushing across. So you're going to generate this wind that's going to blow westward. It's going to create drag. Mm, I think we described it better in, except that this is bringing up nutrients, and you can measure that nutrients in grams of carbon per meter squared. That's how scientists measure how much food is in the water, is they actually measure the carbon. Coastal upwelling, California current, from February to August, the winds blow northwest, increasing the, surface, increasing the surface water speed. It veers to the right, so it creates downwelling. Away from the coast, I'm sorry, other water washes in from underneath to take its place. So yeah, winds are blowing from the north and west, pushing down, going away, bringing in water, and so it goes up to 125 to 220 grams of new carbon per meter squared. So some parts of the ocean are really productive and other parts aren't. So when we're looking at ways to feed the ocean or to have aquaculture, you wouldn't want to put food somewhere where there's not going to be any productivity. This super productive upwelling occurs on the eastern boundaries of the world's oceans, Peru, Current, and Manguela, with very strong fisheries. 
So this is what happens with El Nino. Every few years, here's that warm pool. Remember that basin-wide tilt is created by the zonal and trade winds, but what if those winds die off? And that's what happens in El Nino year, is these strong winds die off. When the winds die off, all this warm water sloshes across, and it sloshes across really fast. This thermocline moves up, this thermocline moves down, and it shuts off upwelling. So it doesn't bring any more food there. We first discovered this, I think it was back in 70s or 80s, there's some really, really bad things that happened. Tons of dead dolphins, thousands of dead fish, big change in how you transport happened. So here's a non-El Nino year. Everything's working cool. You've got lots of um, low thermocline here, lots of food, a lot of upwelling. In an El Nino year, all of this water comes back. It changes the circulation completely. You get a bunch more low pressure here, and you start getting more rains. In a non-El Nino year, everything flows this way. In an El Nino year, when the southern oscillation, have you guys heard that term, southern oscillation for El Nino? Maybe not, it's kind of a meteorology geek term. But the oscillation is talking about the, both the sloshing and the change in this, in this cell. The trade winds diminish and then reverse. Now can you imagine for a sailor, if, uh, I'm sure that El Ninos have happened throughout the whole history of the, of the planet, but when you're a sailor, you depend on those trade winds, and one day you're out, you know, and you think, God hates you, you know, the trade winds went away. Something very reliable, and that would be an El Nino year. The, once they reverse, they lead to an eastward movement of warm water along the equator. The surface waters in the central and eastern Pacific come, become warmer, and storms over land increase. This actually affects us all the way over here to Nantucket. So here's this Persistent El Nino and La Nina are exceptions to normal wind and current flow. So during the El Nino, low atmospheric pressure south of Alaska allows storms to move unimpeded to the Pacific coast of North America. So you're gonna change the number of storms occurring here. You're gonna lower your polar jet stream. You're gonna allow more cold air to leak out of Canada and down over us, and you're gonna cause a dry cell to develop right here. You're gonna be wet and cool along the southern part of the United States and you're gonna change the pressure off of here, and usually you'll trigger a few more um, tornadoes and or, uh, hurricanes and cyclones. So weather's wet and cool to the south and warm and dry in the north, in this part of the north. So in La Nina, so El Nino is the, the, the child, in La Nina, um, in the years, high pressure south of Alaska, Alaska blocks the storm track. So winds veer north, lose their warmth over Canada, and sweep down as cold blasts. The Pacific Northwest gets its usual rain, but the Southwest suffers drought. So you get a huge drought here, and you set up a Pacific jet stream that changes this and brings us more wet weather. Here are the La Nina and El Nino over the, since 1950. Here's the changes in that normal wind and currents. Here's the cascade effect. This is why we care, besides the fact that we might have to plow more or have more storms. We dampen the, the walker cell, less winds, more positive feedback. Um, when that water hits the western shore, it's forced north and south. You get no coastal upwelling. You deepen the thermocline. You lose all your nutrients. The west is not any better because your thermocline goes away. It kills sea corals. In 1982 and 83, it killed 75-90% to 90% of corals along the coast of Costa Rica. Fisheries dropped off up to 75%. Seabirds, which eat the fish, start starving. So literally, birds started falling out of the sky. Dolphins started washing up dead. Uh, and people, there was no change in fisheries. There was no big, huge storm. So people can figure out, I mean, it took us, I think it took oceanographers probably 15 years to really figure it out. Fish got transported. We were finding equatorial fish all the way up off of Baja. And fish were, it literally pushed fish out of their currents and down south. And it caused sea level to rise locally up to 20 centimeters. So all of these are large impacts based on a global phenomenon that's basically a reset. And if we're putting more energy into the Hadley cells, then we're probably going to start increasing the number of El Nino and La Nina years or increasing their impact. 
And if we understand all this, then we can work around it. We can change our fisheries. We can try to adapt. But this is pretty large global. And this is a global phenomenon that's been regularized over the last 50 years. And I'm sure it occurred forever and ever. Terrestrial effects and naming. So Ecuador and Peru really take, get the short end of the stick. They lose their fisheries. They get torrential rains from the warm, moist air, so they start having landslides. It leads to floods and epidemics of disease. None of this is fun. In Indonesia, they get severe droughts and forest fires. You have large shifts in biodiversity because you're having animals live at temperatures and in uh, situations they're not used to, especially with the productivity fallout. This alternative, the La Nina, is when the size of the zonal and trade winds are larger. Basically, you're building a larger basin-wide tilt. Oceanographers called this El Nino because the arrival of warm waters occurred around Christmas time. It was the, the boy child, the, the gift. Uh, meteorologists called it the Southern Oscillation because they were all about Walker and the cell. So meteorologists care way more about what happens above the ocean, right? And oceanographers care about the surface of the ocean down. So there really was an argument for years and years, and uh, because you know we've got nothing better to do. So now its name is Enso. So if you really want to win you know, your trivia thing, the name for the El Nino effect is the Easter El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, and Walker was the first person that noticed the change in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin, Australia telling him that there was warm air and coming and a change in the water that hadn't been seen before, observed before. Um, at least it's not my own phone. I've had that happen when I've got, given a talk or my own phone rings in the middle of my talk. There's all kinds of other um, decadal oscillations, specific decadal ones, uh, Indian Ocean, Dipole. These are all cyclic scales of temperature and pressure differences. So they can affect El Nino too. And it's even been theorized that the um, thermohelion circulation can have decadal shifts. And we'll talk about that more in a second. How are we on time? 6.15, how does it go so fast? It seems like we're only talking for five minutes. OK, so we've only got about 10 more slides, but I'm going to keep going because we're getting to one of the most important things, which is thermohelion circulation. So we've talked about circulation in the air. We talked about surface currents. Now we're going to talk about currents at depth. So there's three ways to transport heat in the ocean. Winds, the currents that cre they create, and thermohaline circulation. And this is a very basic component of oceanography. So when ice forms at the poles, it creates a very salty water, denser water underneath it. Ice water is actually fresh water. Fresh water is what becomes ice. If you take salt water and freeze it, and this is actually one of James Roggeveen's very first experiments, um, it's fresh water that's coming out and freezing, and it's getting saltier and brinier, brinier layperson's term, saltier underneath. So icebergs are typically fairly fresh. Um, this water that's underneath freezes at minus 1.8 degrees Celsius because there's more junk in it, so it's going to lower the freezing temperature. So it's colder, so it sinks. Where sea ice is being actively formed, assuming we're not overheating our planet, this it creates this cold, salty air that then sinks and flows all the way across the ocean. It's pulled down by gravity, and it moves with influence from Coriolis effect. It does sink all the way down 4,000 feet, 4,000 meters to the seafloor. It'll fill up the basins around Labrador and Greenland and Iceland and then start sinking and going all the way around the world. The movement of water due to different densities is known as thermohaline temperature and salt circulation. Temperature salt circulation. The ocean is very density stratified, and we're going to talk about that more next week. I know this is kind of going backwards a little bit, but with the densest water at the bottom, which makes sense, right? Dense water sinks. There are five common water masses. Surface water, central water, intermediate water, deep water, and bottom water. Pretty simple. Um, believe it or not, though, we didn't know any of this or didn't really think about it very much until Wally Broker. And the cool thing is Wally Broker is my oceanographic grandfather. And I can explain it this way. He worked at Lamont Dougherty, and one of his best students was my advisor, Peter Sanchi. So I got to meet Wally Broker. So in academia, your, your parents are basically your advisors 
and their advisors are your academic grandparents. So he's my academic grandparent. He's crazy too, he's really nutty, brilliant guy, loony, super loony. You go into his office, yep? So if it's less freezing as we go forward in time, as the poles, is that going to totally mess up the AC? Very much so. That's our biggest worry, is that we could shut off. When they talk about shutting off thermal helium circulation, we could shut off that pump. So we could shut off the resetting and the equilibrium. It's like breaking your thermostat in your house. Then one part of your house is going to get cold, and the warm air is not going to move to replace it. That's, that's scientists' biggest fear, is are we messing things up so much that we could actually shut this off? And, what are the, and most of the biofeedbacks are positive which means they make things worse. There's not a lot of negative feedbacks that would account for it. So Wally Broker was very famous for announcing about seven years ago that we're all in trouble. I think he said it in a less politically correct way, but um, he was basically seeing that shutdown of the Gulf Stream and the currents, and he was seeing a change in depth in those currents all the way to the bottom of the ocean floor. Now, the weird thing is we don't have things measuring currents all the way across the Atlantic. We should. And so if it moves 20 miles to the west, we might think it's gone away when it's actually moved. So things can get skewed and moved. Um, but I'll describe a little bit more here. Here's the winter sea ice cover. And see, all of the sea ice is also contributing to the, the exchange of heat. It's contributing to the ability to travel, obviously, back and forth here. And this is now about a third of what it was 50 years ago, so in, in the summertime. So he developed the idea of a global conveyor belt linking the circulations of the ocean and made contributions to science of the carbon cycle. So most of the research I've done is on the carbon cycle and iodine. He's the one that kind of created the idea of using chemical tracers and isotopes to trace the movement of all these uh, the, all this uh, currents. And in fact, the only good thing about Fukushima, right, is it put all of these different isotopes into the water that we can then trace. But here's the, the descent of this cold water. So it's forming ice on a good year. Salty water sinks. This is the North Atlantic deep water and the Antarctic bottom water. It's going to go all the way down here to the Antarctic. And then it's going to return in this cold stream at a higher thing. So every time you drop water, just like the upwelling and downwelling, other water comes in to, to move around. So deep water forms and downwells in polar regions. So we've got two different ones, Antarctic bottom water and North Atlantic deep water. It makes sense, right? You're creating ice. One of them is going up to the, from the South Pole up toward the equator. The other one's going from the North Pole down to the South Pole. This is what gets all of the water moving. So here's your Antarctic bottom water from the south, and here's your North Atlantic deep water. Now this is still denser, so when they hit each other, you get this wedge right here, and the North Atlantic deep water floats on top. This all has a lot of nutrients and a lot of CO2. Here's your intermediate water, and here's your warm surface water coming back to replace it. So this is your sideways view of the Atlantic Ocean thermohaline circulation. This warm water is escaping from the equator and it's being pushed. Remember we said about 10% is transported by winds and then probably another 20 to 40% transported by this heat right here. Probably more than that. If the Bering Strait wasn't so shallow, it'd probably flow over there, but um, the Bering Strait acts as a dam, so this cold, dense, salty water flows into the Atlantic through gaps between Greenland and Iceland and Iceland and Norway. That's why we're most concerned about what happens with Greenland and Iceland, with the glaciers and with the ice pack that's on those two areas. Um, it mixes with some cold surface water in the shallower Arctic area and forms the North Atlantic deep water. Same process in Antarctica, everything else I just described. Here's a sideways, I left this in here. For some people it makes more sense to see it. Here's that surface water. Here, here's that warm water coming here. Here's the size of the North Atlantic deep water, huge amount of water. The Antarctic bottom water is colder and moving a little faster, but there's much less volume. There's way more ice being created in the Arctic than Antarctic, which seems counterproductive, but that's the way it is. So here's putting it all together. Here's that 
cold water coming around here, it comes all the way down, and we can date this. So this water over here in the Pacific is much older than Atlantic water. All this water is younger. This water is closer to 400 million years old, 400, 600,000 years, I'm sorry, 600 years and 200 years. I'm confusing sediments and water. So this is all repeating throughout the entire world, and it's all connected. So if you mess up something, uh, this is you know, where you're getting your monsoons, all of your tropical storms are all being created here. There's nothing but warm water here, right? If you go surfing there, you, you discover that it's warmer. You've got a lot of cold water here, a lot of cold water uh, as we know up here at depth. And so the blue ones are colder, the warm ones are surface. Here's a, another way of looking at it in a pro 3D profile. All of this adds up to you know, the same amount of temperature and heat. So a few mechanisms can get the deeper, denser water forced back up. Not very many things. But deep water can be brought to the surface in areas of the ocean subjected to upwelling, like off of Peru. Tidal action, as the ocean's tides ebb and flow, friction occurs at the seafloor, and sometimes that can entrain some deep water up. This mixing helps stir the ocean. And to a lesser extent, gravitational potential energy created at the beginning of that latent heat can force it up later, though that doesn't help us very much. So THC, in this case, thermal halene circulation, is measured by radioactive decay. The first thing we looked at was tritium, which is H3, also known as hydrogen-3. It's a radioactive isotope of hydrogen created in bomb fallout with a half-life of 12.3 years. Most of my papers, if you guys get really bored and want to read a lot about bomb fallout, that's what I've written about the most. Um, and so when we had all this nuclear testing, which we had in the 60s and 70s, we blew the you know, bejesus out of things at Bikini Island and all over in Nevada um, in Russia. And you can measure those radionuclides as they traveled around in the atmosphere and in the ocean. So they'd float around in the atmosphere and they'd get in different layers of the stratosphere and then they'd rain out in different areas of the ocean and they'd be entrained in biological things and in the ocean. So, so Soviet bomb, it, it's both, it might seem depressing but it's actually it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, what it was for radioisotope chemists was like dropping alarm clocks that were set at certain times in different parts of the world and those clocks would tick down as the isotopes would decay. So an isotope has a radioactive decay rate, it's not going to change no matter if you eat it or shake it up or you know, whatever, it's still going to run down. And so we can use these clocks to trace the movement of things. The bomb fallout from the Soviets, we're blaming the Soviets, but the United States had plenty to do with this, delivered tritium from the atmosphere to the ocean via rain collected into rivers. So yes, literally half of my, my undergraduate was collecting 200 to 2,000 gallons of rain and then getting it down to a little amount and checking the beryllium or the tritium in that. Unfortunately, there's not much tritium because most of it's decayed. Half-life of 12.3 years, in 60 years, all this tritium goes away. So oceanographers use this to track the water as it moves south. In the first 30 years, you could see how much tritium was in the water at depth, and you could tell how old the water was based on that tritium. In the first 30 years, North Atlantic deep water moved from 60 degrees north to 45 degrees north, about 100 kilometers per year. That's pretty darn fast when you think about it. More recently, um, THC has been tracked using radioactive carbon, which has a half-life of 5,730 5, plus or minus 40 years because the tritium is all gone. And of course, we use radioactive carbon for measuring all kinds of things. We also use beryllium. You can, there's, there's these radioactive tracers and everything. So connecting all the dots, summarizing what we've been saying. Deep water in the ocean is well oxygenated because it originated in the surface water and then sank down and it kept all its oxygen. The cold water holds more oxygen and there's not much in the way of metabolic um, pr processes to use up this oxygen. When this cold water flows out, something has to flow in to balance it and that's that warm surface air, water from the tropics that flows in north and south to fill in these gaps and keep the poles from becoming too cold. So all of this is balancing the heat budget for the poles and equatorial regions. Last slide, I think, for this is talking about studying currents. We use all kinds of things. We use drift bottles, drift cards. 
Woods Hole actually releases um, all kinds of drifters all the way up to Plum Island and then around to Woods Hole. And let's see, well, well, this will be your test. Where do you think all those, a lot of them arrive on Nantucket. Where on Nantucket do you think they show up? Any surfers? No, surfers. <laughs> no. Getting closer, Surfside. All of them show up literally in like a hundred foot area of Surfside. No matter where they're, you know, well, I mean, you could drop it off in Europe or someplace, but almost all of them get entrained and it's hilarious. They literally, I've retrieved five of them for Woods Hole and they've all been in the same hundred to 200 foot section of Surfside. Hence the good surf. That's just where everything, that's where the conveyor belt's coming back for Nantucket. Now it also depends on the time of year. We've got all kinds of crazy things happening tidally. We've got upwelling occurring in some areas like in Sconset because of the angle of the beach. But um, it was amazing to me that Surfside lived by where it's supposed to be. People have released rubber duckies. A Slocum glider is a glider that goes to a certain depth and stays there and then just travels around the globe. You can look at, um, in my opinion, things like chlorofluorocarbons. Um, when you would use spray cans, any kind of chemicals, you can tr use those to trace. If you know where they originated, you can use it to trace the age of the ocean and the speed and the current. So if we see, you know, usually as you go down through the ocean, you're not going to find in 400-year-old water microbeads, right? You're not going to find something that's only existed for 20 or 30 years or for five years. So each time we create something kind of silly, we use that to trace the currents. And that's the only good thing about the Pacific gyre uh, and all that plastic is we're able to trace the currents. Um, and of course, you've got different things tracing surface winds and surface currents versus currents at depth. And you guys realize that, of course, when you're swimming, you can feel the currents occurring at depth, which are way different than the surface currents. And I think, I will look, I think that is the last slide. It sure is. So we've got a few minutes for questions. It's 628. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to tack on all that sediment work next week, or two weeks from now, when we start talking about uh, phytoplankton and radial area. And I'm going to show a lot of beautiful things that are relative to creatures in the sea. So we're going to be able to see how silica and um, carbonate and everything move around in the ocean and are attracted to creatures. Yes? Move, yeah. What about, I mean, would be able to see it plane? You can, you, if you've got velocity meters, you can see it. You can also see it in the movement from when you're looking at clouds. Um, usually you can see it. Most of the time it's from satellites. Because you were saying you were seeing it from a boat. Oh, Gulf Stream, Gulf Stream, Gulf Stream. Yeah, yeah. Jet Stream, that would be really impressive from a boat. Yeah. But, so I'm thinking from a plane, would you really be able to... Like, you, you could see it from a plane, yeah. It would look, it's a very different color. So usually you've got blue on either side and then it's really, really brown because it's got more nutrients in it and it tends to bring a lot of junk with it. So, um, and it's really moving. I mean, you can see the difference, the density difference from, I mean, it, and it's really funny on a boat. As soon as you cross it, it's just like you've gotten on a, a conveyor belt at an at, uh, air, airline or something like that. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's probably one of the coolest. I've seen four or five amazing things. I've seen the green flash. I've seen that. I've seen dolphins you know, from, hundreds of mile, or from dozens of miles away going through bioluminescence in, at night. Um, so there's a few things I would put in my top 10 lists of things to see in the ocean. Maybe we'll do that at the very last class. We'll do some pretty pictures. Because you guys have really suffered through the gas laws and Newton's laws and Coriolis effect. And, I know all of this is, it's, it's a lot, and it's a lot of information, but as, just let us sink in, look at the you know, Dropbox things. A lot of it's going to just fly off your head, just like you know, from centrifugal force, but don't worry about it, because some of it will sink in, and when you're out floating around, or you're looking at weather patterns, you'll go, oh yeah, that's where that high pressure is, and there's a little mound of air there. You know, it, you'd be surprised how much you're absorbing. Any more questions? Yep. Sarah? Is it possible to predict when the next will be They're getting better at that. They predicted the one we're having now really well. Unfortunately, the one we're having now is as bad as 86 and 87. 
which is a really bad one. So as we get better about looking at sea surface temperatures, and as we get better at our predictive, um, as we put more buoys in the ocean, we can look at changes, micro changes, in centimeters of water, and we can see that relaxation. So we're putting out more equipment that's able to measure it, and we're getting much better at predicting it. What we're not getting a lot better at is how to, it's not something you can fight. So um, with fisheries, for instance, they're trying to think of subsidies for fishermen. It's kind of like when you work with farmers for drought years versus wet years. Do we start providing subsidies for fishermen during El Nino years? Because they go from getting $2,000 a month worth of fish to zero. So, and what we can do to help birds and stuff, there's not much we can do on stuff like that. So we're getting better at predicting it, but I don't, I think it's one of those things where we're gonna have to learn to adapt to it because it's a natural oscillation. All the way back there and then come forward. When it comes to uh, draining the proverbial bathtub, mm -hmm. what is the northern hemisphere draining clockwise and northern southern hemisphere draining counterclockwise through the toilet type? That's a common kind of myth thing for your toilet, for instance, that it's rotating one way. That's usually more a function of how your drain is set up. If your bath, bathtub was big enough, you could. And for years, I believed it until I read, I think, a probably on Snopes.com and then started studying it. And the whole toilet thing, you know, like in Australia, you always go, oh, it flushes. It. No, it's, it's, not, it's not different. But, but, you know, if it's a big enough toilet, it would be, though. So it's only just a function of the size of the basin. It's not big enough to, your, your swirling of the physics of the water entering the toilet is overcoming the Coriolis forces. Dylan, you had one? It's, yeah, it's measuring both sea surface temperature and ocean currents and velocities. I don't know how, I'll look up and see how deeply it can measure it. It's probably only the first meter. Um, but each time we really, and the more satellites we put up, the better we can get information on direction and size. Because if three satellites are looking at the same point, you get that, that angle that tells you differences down to half centimeters. You can really tell it with GPSs. Now, global positioning satellites. Now we know where we are to, you know, a couple of feet. And 20 years ago, it was more like a couple of meters that we knew. But that's good. I'll go ahead. So it's the buoys that will help us. You have to have both. Yeah, you have to have both, and that's a tough thing because NASA or um, the NSF just defunded a huge national environmental ocean buoy system observational network, and they had put oh my hundreds of billions of dollars in but they didn't have enough money. And so they're kind of refunding that and trying to figure out what they're gonna do. Um, and so they're taking offline a lot of the buoys that they needed. There's a really cool buoy off of Martha's Vineyard. There's some more around Nantucket than when we first got here, but you have to combine the two. And it's really better to have three, to have people in boats, buoys, and satellites. Because you, then you're all ground truthing each other. And that's true for seals, coastal erosion processes, you have to have different ways of measuring. But I'll read up on that and get you some information next week. I think I have two pieces of homework right now. Um, does the, uh, when the jet stream moves out of its normal pattern, as it did in the fall, it was moved to the north, which gave us a very mild fall. Does mm -hmm. that have a material effect on the ocean currents? It, vice versa. The ocean currents usually push the dredge seam. The ocean currents they get started by parts of the atmospheric circulation that affect the jet stream, but they tend to have more feedback on that polar, on that polar vortex. So it is just like a hernia, basically. If it is forced up by high pressure, then it keeps the cold up, but when it relaxes, then it allows that cold to drain down into the United States. And that's more driven by currents and atmospheric flow. So they're both related, but most of the time the ocean currents are putting more pressure on the jet stream, I think, or in that polar vortex and vice versa. Yeah, and a lot of that's related to, and that's where the Coriolis effect really comes into play too, and the changes in heat transfer and high and low pressures. So once you put it all together, it makes a lot of sense. But you can see too why meteorologists and oceanographers argue, right? Because oceanographers are like, oh, the ocean's the most important, and meteorologists are like, it's all about the atmosphere, so. Hence the name ENSO. Uh, but they're getting better about working together, that, but that probably has a, that affected a lot of the science behind climate change. 
is uh, the uh, arguments between meteorologists and oceanographers. Oceanographers are looking at you know, 400 to 600 year old ocean water and millions of years of sediments versus climate that occurs over a couple of weeks or over a year or two. So it's different time scales too, different ways of speaking. Yep. That's well. They would anticipate your equator, your equatorial temperatures will go up about 30 degrees. Your poles are going to drop about 30 degrees. So all the temperature is going to reset. The centripetal force and the movement of the Earth is going to still help with the sloshing around and with some of the currents. Um, so it's not we're not totally doomed, um, but it's not something we can fix easily. Then we'd have to think about not only how do we inject more carbon into the ocean but how do we, we might have to set up big turbines in the ocean to create man-induced circulation. I mean, we'd have to really come up with some engineering fixes that are pretty, pretty big. And we would have, that would totally shorten our growing season. Well, I mean, we'd have a lower growing season near the equator, but you'd have bigger deserts, longer droughts, bigger rainstorms, bigger monsoons, which we're seeing now. So, do you think this is happening? pardon? What I see, well, when Wally Broker first talked to the papers three or four years ago, he's kind of excitable, and he was like, oh my God, we're all doomed. I think he said more like another word, but not doomed. Um, and of course, you know, that makes good copy in the New York Times, and that's because when they looked for that countercurrent over by the Canaries, they didn't see it. He's like, we're not seeing this return flow, and it's because it had moved into the central part of the Atlantic and the central part of the Pacific, it had moved to the, to the um, west, you know, about 100 miles, and it also had deepened, which was a relief. So they had to go and look for it, and they're like, oh, here's the current, okay, what does that mean? So at the time he thought, we're really in trouble, and now he's thinking, well, maybe that whole ocean conveyor belt kind of does this number. It gets away, but maybe that increases upwelling. That, that's what is fascinating, is we know so little about our home. <laughs> about where it'd be like if you went to your home and you went, I never knew I had this bedroom here. <laughs> I've lived here all my life and I have this beautiful bedroom that someone's been cleaning. You know, so that's the same thing with the ocean. Where we think it's resetting isn't always where it's resetting. So it might be contracting and going deeper. So that energy and that temperature are being conserved. So it's not like we're flinging energy off into space. We've got to put, put that temperature and that energy and that velocity and that that force equals mass times acceleration has got to go somewhere. So all of that's conserved. For every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So um, he was pretty worried about it, and we still don't know exactly how bad that's going to get and what kind of resets we're going to have. There might be some resets where we have, you know, like the mini ice ages that they talk about, where you have such a change in temperature that something snaps. So, um, but that's probably the, you know, not to make a pun, but the most exciting thing to be studying right now is what's happening. And there's so little known about the Atlantic Ocean that we traverse. What, one of the things scientists are trying to do is get more ships of opportunity. Like if you get cargo ships to take CTDs, conductivity temperature depth finders with them and shoot them overboard as they're going across transporting cars, maybe those things can be opportunistic ways to collect science to give us more information. And we need to have more of that. And also, you guys are all picking up on this well, but basic science is not sexy. If I'm up here saying, this little coral reef cures cancer, you're like, here's a million dollars. But if I go, I like to put a couple of buoys out to measure surface currents, everyone's like, eh, you know. So it's trying to get people to understand that this basic science isn't all that basic and that we don't know much. That's a good question from one of my very first students. Any more questions? You guys have really hung in there well with all the physics. Next week we're looking at lots of pretty pictures and seeing Tina Fors and stuff. Amy's waving her hand. I just want to make an announcement that actually next week we're taking off from Sarah. She's going to go on biotech and science. She'll be back with two more sessions, February 2nd and 9th. But next week we're at 7. We're doing a travel log to Iceland, a short movie and photography by Tim. Wow, that sounds cool.